Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, hello. My name is Gabby and welcome. So, today's video is about a case because I'm always upfront with you guys. I'm always very transparent with my subscribers. It's a case that is the number one case that I've been kind of nervous to talk about on my channel. Chances are, if you're watching this video right now, you enjoy a good mystery and you probably are like me and spend hours and hours and hours watching true crime videos on YouTube or watching documentaries on Netflix or reading books about it. I mean, that's how I am and chances are you're like that also. But you have to remember that yes, these cases are interesting, but there's an entire family behind these cases. A lot of the times, whether it is a missing persons case, whether it is an unsolved case where somebody's life was taken, a family is torn apart and that's exactly what happened with this case. This case has a lot of pointing fingers at different family members and it's very unfortunate, of course, if none of the family members were involved. All of the information I'm going to be discussing in this video is public information. I will not be including a lot of personal opinions when it comes to this case. I'm just going to include the pretty basic ones that a lot of you guys are probably thinking, mostly because I don't want to upset anybody. It's just one of those cases. So with all that being said, let's get into it. This is the disappearance of the Fandel children. Scott Curtis Fandel was 13 years old. He was born on January 23rd, 1965. He would be 54 years old in today's time. He had dark brown hair and blue eyes. He was four feet, 11 inches tall and weighed around 75 pounds. He was last seen wearing a striped shirt and jeans. He was known as being very energetic and a bit of a prankster. Amy was Scott's little sister. She was eight years old. She was born on August 25th, 1970. She would be 48 years old in today's time. She had blonde hair and brown eyes. She was four feet tall and weighed around 50 pounds. She was last seen wearing a sweater, a red and blue vest, and striped jeans. She was an adorable little girl known for being far more reserved than her brother. Scott and Amy lived with their mother in Sterling, Alaska, an area with a population of around 5,000 people at the time, and in today's time is mostly known as a tourist spot where people go to hike, hunt, and fish. They lived on Scout Lake Road about a half mile south of Sterling Highway, the main highway in Sterling. Roger Fandel came into the picture when Scott was two years old, and Scott took his last name. Then a few years later, Amy was born. In January of 1978, Roger left the family, including his biological daughter. Apparently their mother, Margaret, was very stressed out during this time, which is understandable. She had been with Roger for about 10 years and it ended very bad. And now she was left with all the bills and taking care of two children. And according to some sources, she began to drink heavily at times. Scott and Amy spent the evening of September 4th, 1978 with their mother and her sister, Kathy, at a restaurant bar in Sterling called Good Time Charlie's. Their aunt Kathy was staying with them at the time. She had came in from Illinois and was planning on getting a job where Margaret worked and helping out with the children. Margaret and Kathy decided to drive Scott and Amy back to the house around 10 p.m. and then they themselves were going to go back out for the night. The distance between the bar and their home was about 10 minutes. They drove back, dropped the children off, and left. We do know that when Scott and Amy got home, I would say it was somewhere around 10.15 to 10.30, they decided that they were going to go to their neighbor's house, the Luptons. Scott and Amy spent a lot of time with the Lupton children. I don't really know a lot about these children. I don't really know how many of them were female, how many were male, what their ages were. I just know that there were five Lupton children. Like I said, Scott and Amy spent a lot of time with the Lupton children. They even walked to and from school together. Now it was a little bit late at this point and honestly I don't even know why they decided to go next door and why the Luptons 
parents or mother or father were okay with Scott and Amy coming over this late because you do have to remember this was a school night, this was a Monday. Nonetheless, Scott and Amy went over to the Luptons, they spent a little bit of time there and it started getting a little bit too late and the kids, all the kids were playing, they were getting rambunctious, they had turned the mattresses into trampolines basically so the Lupton's mother said that it was time to wrap everything up it's time for everybody to get settled in for the night and go to bed and time for Scott and Amy to head home I'm not entirely sure what time Scott and Amy left the Lupton's house and made their way back home we do know that they did make it home and there was a neighbor that drove by the house and saw that the lights were on around 11 45 so chances are they were back home by 11:45. Somewhere between 2 a.m. to 3 a.m., their mother and aunt arrived back home, and the lights were all off in the house, which did strike Margaret as odd because both Scott and Amy did not like the dark. They usually always left at least one light on in the house if they were home alone. When it came to the front door, it was unlocked, but it was always unlocked because the lock was broken. The kitchen, though, was the strangest thing of all because a pot of boiling water was left on the stove and a package of macaroni and a can of tomatoes sat on the counter. Their mother figured it was Scott's because he always liked to make a meal before going to sleep. Their mother realized very quickly that Scott and Amy were not in the house, but according to her, she figured they had just went next door to the Lupton's and spent the night. I don't like criticizing parents at all and their decisions because I am not a parent myself. I know that being a parent is very stressful. You're not thinking straight a lot of the time. And of course, when it comes to Scott and Amy's mother because she was going through so much at the time, but there's a few things that I just don't understand about this. Scott and Amy's mother probably did have a few drinks. I mean, anyone really would if they had gone out to a bar or restaurant and their sister was in town. You're gonna have a few drinks, you're gonna have a good time. But she walked through the door and she saw that the scene was very odd and she didn't really think much of it. And I guess maybe that is explainable because she did have a few drinks. So do take in consideration that Margaret, their mother, had a few drinks in her system at the time and her sister probably did as well. Not entirely sure how they got home, if they drove drunk, if one of them hadn't drank anything. I don't know any of this information. But when they walked through the door, this was the scene that they saw. Anybody who would walk into this kitchen and is thinking 100%, anybody who would walk into this kitchen and is thinking clearly at the time would notice the boiling water and would try to go find out whose it is if they want to finish cooking what they're cooking, if they want you to turn it off. I mean, this is just a logical reaction to seeing boiling water left on the stove. She did think that this was quite bizarre, but she just turned the water off and I guess headed to bed. The next morning on September 5th, 1978, Margaret woke up and started getting ready for work. Their mother was 31 years old at the time and worked at a restaurant. When she still didn't see her children, she figured they had just gotten up and ready for school at the Lupton's home, thinking maybe they brought clothes with them the night before when they left. She left for work around 8.30 a.m. Her sister Kathy did not wake up until noon. The thing that I really don't understand is that to know that her children were still gone that next morning, she had to have peeked into their room. And if she peeked into their room, wouldn't she have maybe seen their school stuff there? Most children do keep their backpacks somewhere out in the open in their room, especially if they have school the next day. So maybe she just didn't notice the backpacks in the room. Maybe they were in the closet. I don't know. If she did realize this at the time, the search for these two children could have started a lot sooner. Somewhere during her shift, she decided to call her daughter's school and talk to her daughter and make sure everything was okay and that her and Scott had made it to school okay. Well, she called her daughter's school and she was informed that her daughter and her son had not made it to school that day. So obviously, like any mother, she started panicking. She begged her boss to let her off from work and they said no. While Margaret was still at work, her sister Kathy was at her house. After the Luptons got home from school that day, they walked over to Scott and Amy's cabin and knocked on the door.
Kathy answered, and the Lupton children asked where Scott and Amy were. She was told that not only did Scott and Amy not go to school that day, but also had not spent the night at the Lupton's home. She phoned Margaret, and Margaret phoned the police immediately. The police searched the home but couldn't find much to go off of. There were not signs of a struggle, no evidence left behind. The only thing they really found were bullet casings, but it was unknown if these had anything to do with the children's disappearance or not, and they were found outside, so it looks like they were just left in the area from a little bit before. Not long after they disappeared, Margaret tried to contact Roger, but it was apparently very hard for her to get a hold of him. She finally did, and he made his way to Alaska to help in the search. Reports came in that a black sedan was seen speeding out of the neighborhood on the night of their disappearance. They never found out if this incident had any connection to the case or not. Apparently, one of Margaret's friends owned a black sedan, but the person had an alibi. Scott and Amy have never been located, and there has never been any evidence found as to where they could have gone or who could have taken them. There is very, very, very limited information on this case online, but the theories are pretty much endless, and we're going to talk about some of those right now. The thing police suspected, like in many cases, was that Scott and Amy had ran away. It was no secret at all that Scott was not 100% happy since Roger left and that he did have to look after his sister a lot when his mother was not at home. It was theorized that maybe Scott conspired a plan to run away and bring his sister with him. But there's one thing about Scott, and that was that even though he was 13 years old, he had great knowledge about the wilderness. He had recently finished a wilderness survival course, and there's no way he would ever venture into the woods with his little sister without bringing any proper gear with him. According to his mother, he also cherished his Yamaha motorcycle, and there's no way he would ever leave it behind. The motorcycle at the time was about $3,000, and he rode it everywhere. Scott was very headstrong, and he was also extremely protective of his little sister, Amy. So the fact there was no sign of any struggle in the home and no reports of anyone hearing screaming is very odd. If anyone tried to abduct them, there's no way Scott would have just voluntarily went with them and let them take his sister as well without at least trying to put up a fight or get someone's attention. Unless, possibly, they knew the individual or individuals. Investigators originally thought that maybe Roger Fandel had something to do with it. Maybe he decided to take the children. When you take it into consideration, it does make a lot of sense because that would explain why there was no signs of a struggle, no one had heard them scream, because maybe they went with somebody they knew and Roger would be that perfect person. One person that believes that Roger may be involved is Scott and Amy's Uncle Terry on their mother's side. He had a post on Web Sleuths, and here's what he had to say. This case will be solved only if someone talks, but after 30 years, that seems unlikely. It appears that Amy is alive, but will not come forward for reasons known only to herself. She knows we are looking for her. It has been speculated that Scott was hurt, and that is why he hasn't tried to contact her mother. The father has never tried to help my family in any way. In fact, he threatened me after I returned from Alaska. I went to California and spoke with his father. He turned me away. So he is at the top of the suspect list for me. According to many sources online, apparently a woman who claimed to be Roger's girlfriend told Terry that for $5,000, she would tell him what happened to the children, that Roger was involved and she would let him know everything that happened with Scott and Amy and where they are now. I couldn't really find much information on what came of this, but I'm guessing Terry did not give her the money and I'm guessing she did not come forward with any information. Police interrogated Roger for many, many years and he always stuck to the same story that he never had anything to do with their disappearance and there has never been any sightings of the children with him through all these years. In the end, police kind of gave up on this theory because there were no solid evidence and they came to the conclusion that he didn't have anything to do with their disappearance. This is a case that goes down 50 different directions and I highly recommend that if you are interested in this case, take a look 
at Reddit and take a look at web sleuths and look at all the different posts that are about this case. I am not going to include a lot of my personal findings about this case that I have come across online, even though it is public information, because a lot of it just seems like rumors, but some of those rumors seem like there's a little bit of legitimacy to them. I'm basically giving you the tip of the iceberg with this case, who it involves, what happened, some of the theories, but if you want to dive even deeper into this case, the internet is free for you to do that. After everything I looked into online about this case, I think this is one of the few cases that I've ever talked about on my channel where I really think that they may still be alive out there or at least one of them. This case is very odd. I have a lot of personal opinions when it comes to it, but overall, I just feel like something could have been done a lot sooner when it comes to their disappearance because from the time about estimated the time they went missing or they were abducted to when the police were called, it was about 15 hours. Within 15 hours, you can make it a great distance. I can make it from New York to Tennessee in 15 hours. Dive into this case a little bit and leave your opinions down below because I really, really want to hear what you guys have to say. And with all that being said, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye guys. Just want to let you guys know that I do have a new podcast up on my Patreon. It's my third podcast. You can join my Patreon for as little as $3 a month and get all my exclusive content. You will get all my videos that I have on there. You will get my three podcasts. You will be able to interact with me on there and vote in polls about what cases I cover next, all that fun stuff. So if you want to check that out, link will be in the description.